Can you put Hazar with Yamra? Running. We're already live streaming. We're already in uh, live stream, but um, we can start in already. Whenever you're ready. Hamulai Tanzo Bakherwin, Sir Chow Hatton. Um, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, thank you very much for coming uh, to uh, yet another Mary seminar. Um, our Mary seminars are actually not just ordinary uh, seminars for discussion and uh, exchange of views alone. It's part and parcel of uh, ongoing research into topics that are um, cutting edge, uh, hot topics, uh, issues that touch on everybody's lives and they are priority um, subjects in terms of policies, uh, decisions, um, uh, especially in the areas of uh, politics, economy, security, uh, governance, democracy, human rights, and so on. So deliberations of these meetings would be written up in policy reports. There will be recommendations. Therefore, we take these opportunities as um, 
uh, the place or we create the environment, the, the uh, academic and independent environment to very frankly and openly uh, debate uh, these issues, um, exchange views, problems, uh, but more importantly, offer solutions and where possible, would ask people to offer help with solutions. So diagnosis, treatment, but also the service that goes with that treatment. Um, so we would like uh, you to also remember that we are not here just to touch on the wounds and the problems and then let go. We have to be focused on how we can contribute to solving issues and problems and offering help, designing roadmaps together, exchanging visions, um, and then we will, it'll be our job to write them up. It is my pleasure and great honor to introduce um, Frank Baker, um, Ambassador uh, of United Kingdom to Iraq. Um, His Excellency is a dear friend. Um, he is well known to most of you, if not all of you, uh, but importantly, he's a man who's um, very much liked and respected by uh, politicians across the board, back and in Pakistan. Thanks to his track record, his long engagement with the politics of the region in his previous incarnations, um, Frank was, um, well, just before coming here, was uh, ambassador to Kuwait. But before that, he was uh, one of the strategists in the um, Foreign Commonwealth Office uh, in the United Kingdom. He has played major roles in designing policies to do with human rights, politics, Middle East. He had uh, been responsible for the Iraq desk. And in the 90s, during the tough years of the 1990s, he was frequenting Kurdistan, the helping our political establishment, how to achieve peace, stability, reconciliation, conflict resolution, and so on. So Frank um, uh, is new to us, and uh, he's not somebody who's discovering Kurdistan. He's been here for a long time. His insight is unique. And importantly, um, Frank has been in a tour the last few days, meeting leaders um, both in Baghdad and in Soleimani and Erbil. Uh, debating current issues and politics, uh, as always offering his hand of, of help, offering um, ideas and solutions. So that's why um, we are all keen to know what he managed to pick up and what uh, he, might, he would like to uh, touch on and, and so on. And Frank, you are not just known as obviously as an ambassador or somebody with um, economic outlook. Uh, people would love to hear. Uh, from you about politics and uh, your uh, vision and your take of what is happening and the dynamics both in Iraq and in Kurdistan in your usual frank way. So without any further discussion from me, I'll hand over to you. I'd like to put this on your tie or somewhere and then the floor is yours. Can I just remind people while Frank is with you, Mike, um, the first part of our discussion, or the first part of the seminar, that's Frank's talk, will be live streamed and uh, broadcast, but the question and answer session will be carried out under Chatham House rules, uh, so the cameras will be switched off, and people can use the information the way they like without attributing it to anybody. This is to encourage a very frank and open uh, discussion environment so that we all speak our minds. Uh, um, in this um, debate. Frank, it's yours. Um, Dilla, thank you very much indeed, and uh, it's very, very good to be here uh, this afternoon. I suppose I should start by saying that, um, as Dilla said, I have dealt with Iraq and the Middle East region for nearly 30, well, over 30 years now, um, and there's always a lot going on. And it's always an interesting time to come and uh, come and speak to people. But at the moment, but today, I think it's probably even more interesting than, than usual uh, because of the various political and economic challenges that Iraq and indeed the wider region are facing. 
I would start, I think I'm going to start by talking a little bit about, about politics and then move on a bit to, to economics. But I think that the reality is that the two are, are very closely entwined and you can't, you can't talk about one without talking about the other. Uh, and I think I start um, by saying that today, as we look around uh, Iraq, I think we're at some kind of crossroads. I think that the events of the last few months uh, have, in a sense, thrown the kaleidoscope. And by that, what do I mean? Well, I think if you look at the events in Baghdad over the last the last few months, you have seen at the beginnings of what I would uh, suggest are a shifting of um, alliances. I think that as we look around. The, uh, Iraq as a country, as we look at, and particularly we look around the Iraqi parliament and the Iraqi political blocs, I think we can see the beginnings of, uh, of, 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 mo of ma maneuverings. I think we can see the beginnings of, of change. And what we've seen uh, in Baghdad in the last, uh, the last few months have been um, various uh, attempts by different, political, by different political individuals to uh, move the, the government around uh, to look at government formation. Uh, the Prime Minister announced back in February this year that there would be a cabinet reshuffle. Um, he has uh, been pursuing that cabinet reshuffle ever since. Uh, the number of people have been reshuffled in, uh, out and some new people have come in. But at, as we all know at present there is a a, st a standoff, a stalemate, really, between Parliament and the government and the Prime Minister mm. on this. And as this has evolved, I think you know, we have seen the way that different blocs and different political leaders have reacted. Uh, and as of uh, today, we are in a position where Parliament has not has not met for um, uh, over a week. Uh, we are in a position where there is a question mark over the uh, position of the speakership where there is a case going through the court in, uh, in Baghdad about who the current speaker is. Uh, and there are MPs who have been sitting in Parliament for some time, and there are uh, other MPs who left Parliament after the uh, events of two weekends ago, uh, and who are debating whether they're going to return. Now, I think as we look at this, I think we, it's, it's important for us to to consider a number of a number of things. First of all, I think it is important, and we would we would all agree that when countries face crises, what is most important is that the politicians and political leaders find a modus operandi that allows them to work for the good of the country. Now that doesn't mean necessarily that they have to agree on everything. In fact, in any democracy a strong and vibrant opposition is a very good thing because it can hold governments accountable. And I will come on to the point of accountability later. But I think that fundamentally you would expect as a citizen of a country that all your political leaders really want the same thing. Ultimately, although they may disagree about the method and the way and the direction of travel in which allows you to get there, which is that they all want your country to be strong and to be prosperous and to be secure. And so I start my analysis of what has been going on over the last uh, few months, both in Baghdad. Forgive me, um, if you just put this bit and in Kurdistan, in the Kurdistan region, with um, a couple of a, a couple of points, which is that I think. Um, Everybody, everybody in Iraq, everybody really, I think, in the international community knows what the problems are here. One of the, one of the things I remember the late Ahmed Chalabi said to me a few years ago was that, you know, we have, we have debated the problems in Iraq ad nauseum. We have gone through and analysed what the difficulties are and what the challenges are. The time for an analysis and the time for debate really is over. So it is now time for us to come up with the solutions and then to implement the solutions. And so I start from the premise that that is what Iraqi politicians and that is what Kurdish politicians need to do. 
they need to sit down together and they need to work out what the solutions to the problems, the issues that we all know exist and we all know what they are, what are the solutions to those issues. And the best way to do that is through debate, uh, but it is also through working together, even though politically you can work uh, apart. When I was here in the 1990s, I remember vividly that when the Kurdish parties worked together, as they did in 91, 1992, the elections of 92, the decision to go down a power sharing 50 50 route in 92 after the elections, but together things went well. Yeah, they weren't going as well perhaps as they, as they are today. Um, it wasn't, uh, uh, the, 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 the region wasn't anything like as developed as it is today in those days. But they were able to begin to move forward an agenda that was good for all Kurdish people. When, however, they started to disagree and then those disagreements became violent, as happened in the summer of 1994, then the region started to go backwards. And there's a very clear message, I think, a very clear lesson that you learn from that, which is that even if you disagree with each other politically, you nevertheless do need to sit down and work together to, for, the, for the good of your country, of your region, whatever it may be. And that, I think, is the first, the first point that uh, the politicians need to remember. It's good to disagree politically, but ultimately you need to ensure that you are all working towards the same, the same long-term objective, even if your method of getting there may be different. There is, I think, a second point which flows from that, which is particularly germane at the moment. And that, of course, is that Iraq, uh, in addition to all of the other problems that we have been aware of and we have discussed over the last 30, 40 years, is facing, is also facing a serious uh, security threat from Daesh. And I think what is really interesting, uh, and I'm tying these two points together here, is that in facing that security threat, that the country has come together, the political leaders have come together. There have been disagreements, perhaps. There were issues about which particular part of the, of the, uh, of the country, of the, the, the fighting men of the country, is going to actually uh, address the, the problem, is going to take on Daesh. But ultimately, the, all sides have worked together. And the result has been that following the events of the summer of 2014, over the last uh, two years, 20 months, two years, we have seen Daesh push back. We have seen them um, uh, expelled pretty much from all of, uh, from most of the province of uh, Salah Hadin. We have seen them push back from their closest point of 20 kilometers south of Erbil, back beyond the line from which they started. And now we are seeing them gradually being removed from uh, Anbar government. And that is a uh, achievement. And that is something that the Iraqi people can be very proud of. They can be very proud of their, their fighting men. And I pay tribute to all of those, all of those Iraqis who have fought against Daesh, whether they be fighting for the Iraqi security forces, for the Iraqi army, whether they be Peshmerga, whether they be Hashd al Shabi. Because they have all fought together and they are working together to push Daesh out. And by working together, even though they may have different modus operandi, even though they may ultimately have different political agendas and objectives, they are working together and they are being, they are being successful. Um, turning, uh, moving on now uh, to, the, to, to, to what, 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 what needs to happen now, I think, in, in, in Iraq. Um, as I said, we are, I think we are looking at a, at a, a, a historical, um, a historical here in the country politically because I think we are looking at uh, a change, a shifting of alliances. We're looking at new possibilities opening up. And as I sit here in Erbil, the message that I have been giving to, to Kurdish political leaders is that now is a great opportunity for uh, the Iraqi Kurds. Now is an opportunity for the Iraqi Kurds to engage again in the politics of Iraq. To look at, uh, to, to look at working with uh, like-minded allies across the country in trying to move move the country forward, and in doing so, and by that I mean your MPs uh, returning to Baghdad, um, to be part of the uh, new coalition that will inevitably grow up 
um, to support whoever the Prime Minister may be. At present, it is Prime Minister Haider al Abadi. And if the new coalition grows up to support Prime Minister Abadi, um, then uh, it is important for me, I think, for the Iraqi Kurds to be part of that because actually now is an opportunity for all of these issues that are out there for people to sit down and to talk them through. Sit down and talk through the challenges that are facing you all. Sit down and talk through the political challenges, the economic challenges. I'm going to come on to that in a moment, but just remember those economic challenges that you face here in Erbil are exactly the same economic challenges that they face in Baghdad, that they face in Basra, that they face in Najaf, that they face in Ramadi. They're the same around the country. Uh, and I think that it is uh, an opportunity to sit down and talk seriously about a long-term agreement around the relationship between Baghdad and Erbil, between uh, Iraq, the, the, the Kurdish region and the rest, of, the rest of Iraq. And in order to do that, of course, to ensure that the uh, that the, um, Iraqi, the, the, the Iraqi Kurdish element of that is able to negotiate from a position of strength, then you need to have a consensus amongst your own political parties here in Erbil. Now, I believe that there is much common ground between the political parties here. Uh, there are, of course, differences of opinion. There are challenges out there. But there are, of course, in the last week, we have seen um, two of your political parties, the the PUK and Goran move closer together and um, to uh, the, the potentially uh, sitting down and agreeing uh, a way forward where they can work closely together. I think this is a positive thing. I don't think this should be seen as a negative thing in any way. I don't think it should, should be seen as a challenge or a threat. I think it is uh, the, the natural result of a kind of a, uh, political parties who recognise that their region is facing a crisis sitting down to see if they can agree common ground in order to work together to help the country, the region, overcome it. Uh, and I say that from a position, I think, of authority, because in May 2010 in the United Kingdom, we had elections. And the result of those elections meant that no party had overall control of the parliament, the British parliament. So the two, two of the parties, the largest uh, party, the Conservative Party, sat down with one of the uh, smaller than the minority party, the Liberal Democrats, and agreed a coalition. Now, that doesn't mean that the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats agreed on everything. It doesn't mean that their policies were the same. It doesn't mean that they, they, believe, uh, they believed in necessarily in the same things politically. But what it meant was that they recognised there was a need, the country needed them to work together in order to overcome the economic and financial crisis that we were facing at the time. And the rest, as they say, is history. That coalition government survived and was successful over a period of five years. So I think political parties sitting down and agreeing and, and, uh, and, and coming together in coalition is not something that others should see either as a threat or a challenge, but should welcome because it gives some clarity of purpose to the political uh, issues that, that, that need, to be, need to be resolved. Turning now to the economy. I think that the uh, economic uh, the economic, economic challenges facing Iraq are, of course, very well documented. Uh, not only did you, is, have, has there been a, a was there a big drop in the price of oil, which was the commodity from which Iraq gained most of its revenue, but that was coupled with a, a an attack by Daesh, an existential threat from Daesh, which had to be faced head on. Uh, and wars, existential wars, any wars, cost a great deal of money. So Iraq was hit with this, this double whammy of the, of the war against, the cost of the war against Daesh, while having at the same time uh, to cope with the drop in the price of oil. And of course, that's mirrored here in Kurdistan. Your regional government has had to face up to the same two problems, a drop in the price of, of oil, so that uh, the commodity, a commodity on which the, the, uh, the Iraqi Kurdish region um, relied, uh, had the, the price of that dropped, and at the same time having to fight a, a war on its southern border against, um, against uh, uh, the southern line against Daesh. And of course that was compounded by the, uh, the, the disagreements between Erbil and Baghdad and the disagreements around revenue sharing and around oil exports. But I always say that out of every challenge comes an opportunity, and in this case I think there are opportunities that have arisen both in Baghdad and in Erbil. And in this particular case, I think we can say that the uh, Kurdish regional government, the coalition government, 
has really risen to that challenge. They have taken some very hard decisions. The, uh, the economic reform program that they are driving through, and which the cabinet discussed with myself and my G7 ambassadorial colleagues a couple of months ago, is a, a strong reform program. It does identify many of the problems and many of the areas where reform is required. It looks very hard at the long-term uh, implications of having an over-large public sector. It looks at the implications of having subsidies. It looks at the implications of not having a coherent taxation system or a coherent customs and revenue collecting system. Uh, and it looks uh, also at the overriding difficulties around corruption. And you know, corruption, culture, corruption is a culture. And the culture of corruption compounds economic difficulties. Because it's not just economically wrong, but it's also ethically and morally wrong. It adds to business costs. It adds to opportunity costs. Uh, it means that there is less money for, for the future generations. Uh, not only from the perspective of money in pockets, but also from the perspective of schools and hospitals. Uh, and it means also that the, uh, the corruption will drive inevitably, wherever you are in the world, corruption drives big wedges between the people and the government. And I think it is particularly apt that I'm speaking to you today about, uh, in part, about corruption, because, of course, in London today, we have an anti-corruption summit. And that is uh, an, uh, an international summit. And the people, and I've only seen a number of, a few people speak this morning, but I know that the overriding view coming out of that summit is that more must be done internationally to end the culture of impunity. Uh, and I think that that is where the, the international community can come and they can help. And the international community can help around economic reform because we've all gone through it in the United Kingdom. I just mentioned the public sector here in, in Kurdistan, in the Kurdish region. In the United Kingdom, we have reduced the size of the public sector by a very, very large amount. I think somebody told me that we had cut um, something like 500,000, half a million jobs from, the, from the, the public sector. But at the same time, our private sector has created something like two and a half, three million jobs. So we have had a net fall in the unemployment rate. And that, I think, is a, a model that can be, can be used uh, in, the, in the Kurdish region. And it's a model that we are, we are helping and we are talking to the Kurdish regional government about, just as we're talking to the Baghdad government about, to help try, help try and overcome these, uh, these specific challenges. At the same time, I think the international community helps around transparency, can help around um, ensuring that governments become more transparent. The, there, are many, there are many problems with, there are many issues around transparency. And it's really a question of perception, fundamentally, because if a government is not transparent, the perception is that they have nothing to hide. And the perception is that the corruption is there and that senior figures are taking money. That may not be the reality, but it doesn't matter. It is the perception, which is why transparency is so, so important. And it is why I know that the, the, the conversations that I have had that my foreign secretary had to a couple of months ago here in Berlin in Baghdad. Our conversations with the rich Kurdish government and with the, uh, uh, the Baghdad government have been very clear about the need to introduce more transparency into the, the dealings that they are involved in. Uh, and one of the areas that you can do that is through having audits, having uh, international reputable international companies coming in, auditing your books, and they're making the results of those audits public so that people can see how much money comes in and where that money is going. And that is very much also around in a democracy, around parliament, around parliamentary scrutiny and around budgets. And of course, in Baghdad, you have a 2016 budget which was adopted by parliament and which sets out very clearly the percentages of revenues coming in and where they will go. And you also have a transparent, uh, a, a, degree, a large degree of transparency around the, the revenues in Baghdad because most of it is through oil and most of that oil is being lifted out of the ground by international oil companies who under international law 
are required to be entirely transparent. So you can follow, pretty much follow, the movement of a barrel of oil from, uh, say, the uh, Ramallah field in southern Iran through the trader to wherever it's been, wherever it's going, and then the flow back of the money coming into the bank government. Um, that's important because that does give a degree of transparency and it allows people to know where, where the money is. So it's important for the people. It's also important for the international uh, financial sectors because international financial sectors these days, with the amount of international legislation around, uh, around, around corruption and uh, transparency, but actually also almost more importantly um, around uh, uh, anti-terrorist funding, um, it's absolutely critical for international organisations, the IFIs, if they are going to give support and help to countries, they have to be satisfied that those countries have got a transparent system of uh, revenue collection and a transparent system of revenue expenditure in, in place. So for me, I think it is welcome that the, uh, that the Kurdish regional president, uh, uh, Masoud Barzani, has, has put on record uh, the requirement for the Kurdish region to become more transparent and that uh, the, Kurdish government, the Kurdish regional government is also working on that. But it's not just rhetoric, of course, it's also actions and rhetoric has to be turned into, into reality. Because unless you can remove the perception, you will continue to face problems amongst your, your populations. And then that takes me into the final point, which I think is, uh, is critical when you're talking around this issue of economic reform and of uh, transparency. And it's what, when I first started out in, in, uh, in, in Iraqi Kurdistan back in 1992, we in the United Kingdom, we used to talk about good governance. We don't really use that terminology so much now, but I think good governance is the backbone for a lot of the work that we do internationally around the, uh, around the world. Because good governance means, it means accountability, it means an accountable government, a government that is accountable to its people. It means economic transparency, but it also means um, uh, economic potential, fulfilling your economic potential. But it also means rule of law. And that means removing the culture of impunity around individuals, ensuring that your courts treat everybody the same according to your laws. Uh, and it also means that a free and effective and active media is allowed to operate within the, within the region or within the country. And I believe that those principles hold as true today as they did back at the beginning of the 1990s, when I admit the world was a very different place than it is today. Um, but good governance, I think, is a, a yardstick which, which we could all, all very uh, profitably live, uh, live our lives by, both as individuals, particularly as, as, as governments. Thank you very much. <clears throat>